everybody. Happy Sunday and welcome to episode 12 of the Stock Trading Pit. This is actually the last episode of season three, so we have a lot coming um, in this particular episode. And the daily agenda is going to be four segments as always. Segment one is going to be talking with traders with Dan and guest Steve Burns. Segment two is going to be the broad market recap, looking at some broad market ETFs as well as some crypto. Segment three is going to be the watch list with myself and Scott Redler. He's a first time guest, so we're excited to hear his thoughts on the market going into the weeks ahead. And segment four is going to be the weekend chart requests. We go over a few different requests from our Twitter every week. So sit back, relax, and let's get started. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Talking with Traders, where we get to know the people behind the trades. Today, I've got a great guest with us, Steve Burns of New Trader U. Steve is an author, an educator, and an investor. Steve, thanks for being here. Hey, thanks for having me, Dan. Absolutely, man. It's always great to have you on. Um, for those who don't know, by the way, Steve's been on before for some other segments. So um, we'll definitely put a link to those segments in the description below in case you want to learn more from Steve. So uh, first question for you, my friend. What brought you into the trading and investing world? How'd you get into this? Yeah, it's an interesting step-by-step -step process. I really started as a teenager when I saw the power of a compounded capital chart, how money compounds on itself when left to grow. Uh, so I, that really inspired me at a very young age. And I thought, how can I do that? Then was a the question like, how can you get capital compound and grow like that? Because I was you know, really young, so I knew I had plenty of time. And then the next step was, you know, the stock market and stocks, that's something that goes up in value over time. So really, I started from the compound growth area. Stocks was my vehicle. Then I started with mutual funds and uh, grew from an investor of mutual funds into individual stocks and then into ETFs. You know, I started more as a trend trader, really got the luck of the dot-com era to really, you know, after you have a, an era like that, you're hooked forever pretty much. Uh, by the time I was... Uh, I think I was 27, my account equaled my payout for my house at 27, was it, by 27 years old, it was, and I was like, my gosh, this is incredible way to grow capital, and uh, I, did, I stayed with it, and then as the dot-com era played out, I learned that, you know, trend trading in one direction and uh, holding long-term uh, investments can come back and be down 50, 60 percent, so then I started evolving in ways to not experience another bear market like that and evolve more into trend trading with uh, stop losses and trailing stops and uh, position sizing. So I evolved from that into trading more and more actively. And I really got to, to, to now, I'm more of a swing trader where I trade more of uh, swings on charts, you know, much more conservative than I did in my earlier years, uh, looking at 10% position sizes and just swings over anywhere from five to 10 days to the upside. But, uh, and also some short, short strategies as well when the market goes uh, down. But uh, always risk management is my number one thing. You know, I've achieved most of my goals. And I'm in a good place now. So I just want to incrementally grow my capital with minimal drawdowns. So uh, that's sort of the, how the evolution of, uh, of uh, how I've got to where I am today. You talk about um, mi mi minimizing drawdowns, which is something that I think, especially now in this kind of hectic, uh, choppy market is important. Um, what are some tools that you use to do that? Do you use hard stops? Do you use some indicators? You know, how do, how do you look at managing risk? Uh, I, I look at position sizing first and foremost. I don't really expose myself to more than a 10% position size in an individual stock or ETF or leverage ETF or speculative stock. So if my 10% position size has the worst case scenario for me, you know, be down 10% in a day, that's still only a 1% total capital loss. So I, I build my positions. If something goes up, I'll have more and more positions added. So I might get up to a 60% exposure to risk on correlated positions. I might even go to 80% with maybe some metals or commodities along with some stocks. Uh, but then as they start getting stopped out, as trailing stops are hit, our profit targets are hit, our chart becomes overbought, I start locking in profits either into strength, into my profit tar target, overbought readings, or I'll it goes back below my uh, trailing stop, then I'll lock it in for there. But I'm always looking to expand my equity exposure, exposure into uh, longer term bull markets and swings to the upside. And as things start rolling over, I start decreasing my exposure to risk. So it's sort of a going in and going out for me. It, it sounds like you average up more than you average down. Yeah, I, I yeah. Definitely uh, just get out, get out when trailing stops are hit and lock in profits. That's my biggest thing. I don't want to give back money once I have it. 
That makes a lot of sense. You mentioned uh, leveraged ETFs. Is that something that you actually trade often or just something you watch? Yeah, one of my favorite things to trade are the leveraged uh, ETFs, uh, uh, index ETFs like uh, the SPXL, uh, the uh, the SSO, the UWM, uh, DDM. I love the leverage because you have the smoothness of an index moving, but you have the leverage of getting it worth your trouble to do more than beta. You can double or triple beta and create more alpha with with without the risk of an earnings event or a headline risk as much as you have individual stocks. So it's actually one of my most pop, my 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 uh, favorite things to trade is leverage ETFs for indexes. Fascinating. Um, do you, uh, do you tend to use options on those ETFs or the actual equity itself? Uh, I used to use equity. I used to use more options earlier when, uh, my accounts were smaller, uh, long ago, I would use more, you know, uh, options, especially back in the days where, uh, where there were stocks that were a thousand dollars a share. I would go more into, into, uh, at the money options or in the money options, just to have less capital or risk, still controlling position sizing carefully. But now I've got enough capital to pretty much expose myself to whatever stock you know that i want to so i really stay in equity the only time i will use a option is for short side positions because i want to control the uh the risk the unlimited risk of a short position like people know you know you 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 uh, buy a stock at 10 you buy a stock at 10 you know and if it goes to zero you lose ten dollars but if you short a stock at 10 and it gaps up to 40 or 50 you can lose 30 40 dollars a share so i much prefer using options for the short side so if I do see the volatility expanding early, like a 1030 EMA crossover on the VIX, I might buy a SPY put option. So if there is a wild gap up day, my, my risk is set to just the contract price. Do you, um, do you use, uh, you mentioned EMAs and SMAs, do you use uh, moving average indicators a lot? Yes, uh, and uh, Trent Spider has my indicator, the uh, Steve Burns uh, moving average ribbon, the, the 5, uh, 10, 20, 30, and 50. Those are my key moving average uh, crossover signals on the daily chart. And I you, those are some of my primary back-tested uh, trend and swing signals. So I do use many crossovers as entry signals. Uh, one of my favorite for short term is a 520 crossover to show the momentum of a potential trend, uh, trend or swing. And uh, they do backtest well as a lot of uh, mechanical strategies, even, you know, buying the 520 crossover, selling the 520 cross under, even mechanically backtest well. Now, I'll exit more into strength or in overbought conditions, and but I know what I have to work with on the uh, backtest data. You mentioned, um, you, 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 you talk about backtesting, which is something that I think a lot of traders should do more of, and they don't. Um, you know, how'd you, how'd you start backtesting? And, and, um, what parameters do you tend to look at? You know, do you, do you put a fixed stop into your back test or do you just use the crosses? How mechanical do you get? Uh, I primarily just look for the big trends, like the move. My primary way is just moving averages and crossovers and seeing how trends play out historically. And then I look for the stocks that have the growth potential to continue to make those trends. You know, I want to only trade my watch list all has back tests uh, outside of IPOs, I will trade early IPOs with 520 crossovers because IPOs as a class tend to uh, do well with 520 crossovers early on where they get you into trends and swings to the upside, but get you out when the 520 crosses under, which has been a very good signal in this market recently to get me primarily to cash, except for a few positions here and there during this uh, tech and a small cap meltdown. But uh, yeah, and my whole watch list has based on back tests. So I have crossover signals that I know worked out historically. That's uh, interesting. I don't know if uh, a lot of people do back testing as much as they should. So I, I, I think if you're watching this and, and you haven't spent a lot of time back testing, definitely spend some time back testing. There's a lot of great tools. TrendSpider has one, but there's other back testers that you could use. Um, and they can help you kind of build some rules, right? Maybe not a whole strategy, but maybe some rules around, you know, the chart to kind of keep you from making mistakes, right? Um, so, uh, you know, I'm curious, Steve, um, how'd you go from, I know you do a lot of education, right? And you teach a lot of new traders. You run a website called New Trader University. How'd you go from investing and trading your own money to teaching others? Yeah, it's interesting. Every step of the way was somebody uh, pushed me into it. The only thing I really decided to do myself was Twitter because I always enjoyed Twitter and learning from people and sharing things. And, and I enjoyed Twitter. That's something I did myself. But everything else was a push along the way. Uh, early on in the early 2000s, I was, uh, I think I was a top uh, 70 or 80th most helpful reviewer on Amazon. And uh, almost all that I reviewed was trading books. So I had 
a, a four or five hundred reviews on investing and trading and finance books on Amazon uh, in the early 2000s. And I ended up being a top reviewer. So then a publisher, a small publisher, you know, uh, approached me about why don't I write a Nicholas Darvis book since I have top reviews on all the Darvis books and I've used the, the momentum trend method uh, myself. So he approached me and taught me into writing a Darvis book. So I did that. I thought that was interesting, interesting experience. So then I had an, an inspired to write New Trader, Rich Trader. So I went back to the same guy because I'd studied uh, the trend following books, all the, the legendary traders, the trend followers, the market wizards. I'd studied all of them. So I thought, you know, I knew the principles that I used and what I learned from them reading hundreds of books. So uh, the same guy, he published that. So I did about five or six books published through uh, through uh, being in publishing. And then uh, so that's how it really started. He approached me about writing it because I was a top book reviewer. Then the uh, then later when uh, I married uh, Holly, my current wife, we've been together about uh, seven years now, uh, and uh, she had the idea like we should self publish and have our own pu book to publish our own books because I enjoyed uh, writing it and condensing all my thoughts into books. It really helped me with my trading as well. If you want to learn something, you know, write about it or teach it, and make you grow. So she taught me into publishing our own books. So we did that, and then. Uh, uh, New Trader U originally came from a guy that ran around the octagon. Uh, he liked to make websites. So he said, I should have a website. And I thought, why would I need a website? And, uh, you know, he said he built it for me that I need to be, instead of just being on Twitter, I need to have somewhere for people to go that's mine. So he talked me into doing New Trader U. Uh, so that's how the website started. Then Holly talked me into doing New Trader University because she said I should do e-courses. You know, that's a great way to teach people directly do e-courses so she taught me into that so it's really funny how it wasn't my idea to do any of that that was other people's ideas it's, it's funny how things turn out um so I'm, I'm uh for those watching by the way we'll put some links to some of steve's books in the description um steve was gracious enough to use trend spider charts in in the last two um so we'll definitely give you links to those um you know i, I enjoyed them uh and I, I think i actually wrote the forward for one of them so I, I i hope everybody takes a moment to click on those and you know give them a read um you can get them on amazon um so steve uh uh question for you what sectors in this crazy market that we're living through right now are you watching you know is there anything that you're bullish about are you kind of nervous you know are you bearish What's yeah i'm i'm yeah, I'm stopped out of most of my positions right now. I think all I have left is Monster Energy Drink, uh, MNST, oddly enough. I almost had a uh, 520 crossover in the NASDAQ, QQQ, and QLD, uh, uh, was it yesterday or day before? And luckily, it did not cross over, so I did not get back into the uh, tech. So I'm very lean right now. I'm looking for a 1030 EMA crossover in the VIX. Uh, that would be bearish for me and would set off for me, my systems, a... Uh, increasing volatility signal. So the dangers I see from a, a back-tested standpoint is that the 1030 EMA crosses over in the VIX. That shows that we will be trending up in volatility. And we know markets go from low volatility to high volatility and back to low volatility. And right now, it's uh, it's just now entering the high volatility stage. So I see volatility growing right now. And it looks like a rotation out of small caps and tech and growth into more industrial stocks and energy stocks have been so beaten down over the last year. So to me, this looks like a sector rotation where you can look and see the, the Dow industrial averages green or almost even, and then all the growth stocks and tech stocks and small caps just getting killed. So it looks to me like a big rotation inside, inside of equity itself. Absolutely. You're not alone, man. I got stopped <laughs> out so many times today. It's been, it's been a rough day. It's been a rough few weeks, right? And the market has a way to mess with you. Right. Like it, it'll give you a, a calm day or even a big rally day before it dumps on you again. Um, so I, I think I think a lot of people watching here have experienced that whipsawing lately and, uh, you know, are looking for ways to manage their risk better. Um, it's also interesting to me and tell me if you agree, but I think the last 10 years have been very easy for traders. I mean, there have been times where it's been rough, um, but for the most part, the market, you know, just cut, kept on gaining. Um, yeah. You know, and it's it, it seems like with the economy starting to reopen and, you know, all this recovery stuff, right, that, um, you know, a lot of that growth, a lot of that COVID trade is um, rotating into other sectors. Yes, exactly. I think the market is trying to price in where this one point nine trillion stimulus is going as well. I think that's where people are trying to figure out who's going to benefit from this uh, 
this monetization of debt where they're just cranking endless money into the markets. You know, a lot of that's gone into commodities. A lot of commodities are up. Real estate's up dramatically. And a big change in the market with everyone being so secluded last year with uh, different businesses uh, doing better. It's, it's fascinating to see this is a big uh, uh, reset for the market right here as we come out of this pandemic. Yeah. Yeah, it was. I mean, COVID was like a decade, maybe not a decade, <laughs> but many years of um, technical innovation just crammed into this short period of time. It was like a couple months, right? Um, you know, when nobody could really leave home and all meetings had to be virtual, right? And, you know, it's interesting because I think some industries um, really benefit from that. I mean, look at Zoom, right? Look at Zoom video. Um, you know, they, that, that thing is, you know, even with the recent uh, growth pressure has has incredible returns for last year um you know in other industries uh real estate and things like that have, have struggled in a lot of ways which which is an interesting um dynamic because as the world kind of reopens with all this new printed money right um you know there's bound to be rotation and reshuffling there it's just been too easy yeah and really since 2012 you know every big dip and crash and and bear markets last about a month and it you know you always come back sort of like the 90s it was just same thing in the 90s. I had no trouble making great returns every year, knowing uh, very little what I was doing. I just knew I bought tech stocks and I held them and uh, they went up eventually and you bought the dip and stocks always go up through the 90s. And it took all the way till the, the March of 2000 where the chop started and the brutality of 2001, 2002, even early 2003 before we got back to another great run. Uh, of course, so 2008, which my risk management really helped me. 2008, I came out uh, green of 2008. That's one of my personal favorite accomplishments because <laughs> I just know there was no signals that everything was just going down for so much for so long and the volatility was so high and I knew I wasn't going to go through a repeat of the dot-com meltdown again. So a lot of just staying in cash for a lot of 2008 was very beneficial. But uh, I think the biggest narrative we're going to see going forward is this is the money that the federal government is spending the 1.9 trillion along with whatever the infrastructure could be two or three trillion and where all this these dollars all go go to I think that's the new narrative beyond the Fed now it's even the government spending is going to be like nothing we've ever seen. Yeah, I, I was reading the infrastructure bill they're considering is like three trillion dollars. Right? I don't even know how many zeros that is. That's a lot of zeros. And increasing the U.S. dollar supply by, I think it's uh, 40 to 60 percent over the past year already. I mean, it's just unbelievable. Yeah, you got to wonder where it's going to go. And you got to wonder, um, you know, today, uh, for those watching, we're filming this on Wednesday, a little bit after market close. But today was interesting because both the SPX and um, the 10-year yield went down, right? Um, and typically, there's an inverse correlation there. Right. Um, you know, and then uh, Bitcoin, right, which is supposedly an inflation hedge, right, something that can store value because it can't inflate and um, metals like silver all struggled as well, um, which is interesting to me. Right. Like you would think there would be some inverse correlation, but, you know, when when everything is going down at the same time, that's when I get nervous. And um, yes. I feel like we're entering that territory right now. And it's just raising capital is what it, where you like you said everything goes down. You expect silver and gold to go up when there's inflationary pressure. You expect you know yields to go up and the stocks to go in another direction. But when everything starts correlating, it just shows people are raising cash because of uncertainty. That's never good. Yep, yep. It's a it's it's the market showing you that traders and investors and in particular the the big guys, right, the funds, the big money, are starting to get a little bit nervous. Um, you know, and who knows? I mean, we may bottom, we, uh, everyone may buy the dip again and we may rage to, to, you know, 450 this year, but I think it's going to be choppy on the way there. Yeah. I think I'm just going to follow the price action wherever it takes me. Absolutely. I think a lot of traders would benefit from that mindset, right? Because everybody, everybody on FinTwits, everybody in this space is always trying to predict the next move. You know, you see a lot of, uh, a lot of broken Elliott wave counts right now, for example, <laughs> right? you know, and I, I like that you just keep it simple, right? Yeah, because it really comes down to the the, the core of trading is uh, you know creating a good risk reward ratio. People keep saying, "Oh, these technical analysis doesn't predict anything." It's like I'm not trying to predict anything. I'm trying to create a great risk reward ratio. If I'm wrong, I get stopped out. I'm trying to lose two or three percent on a bad trade. I'm trying when it goes wrong, and I'm trying to make about three to nine percent on a good trade, and that's how I'm going to be profitable. Yep, yep. And, and then, if you if you can do that, you can win um, only half your trades or even less, and you can still be profitable. And your worst case scenario, you lose 1% of your capital, you know, and every now and then you'll have a big runner do 20, 30% of a stock and you'll gain two or 3%. Your, out, your outliers need to be correlated too with asymmetry. So 
that, that's really what it is. I mean, everything else is just opinion. Asymmetry can be the buzzword and vocabulary word of the session. <laughs> so everybody write that down and look it up because um, asymmetrical bets are, are you know, what it's all about. Um, Steve, uh, running out of time here. So I'm going to jump to my last question. I could talk to you for hours, but um, you know, I have to, uh, I have to keep the time. So, um, so I'm going to ask you, uh, and this is a good question in this market environment. What advice would you give someone brand new to trading? And to, to shorten the journey very quickly, the, the new trader has to first understand they have to create and learn how to develop a quantified trading system with an edge. An edge is a positive expectancy model where you understand historically what your losses and wins would have been on, in, the, in the past, and you're going to manage your trades to make sure they're smaller, smaller or bigger in the future. You, know, you want every trade to end in either a small loss uh, a big win, a small win, or break even. You do not want to have big losses. Big losses is the biggest thing that will make you unprofitable. And once you have your quantified system with an edge, you have to trade it with discipline and consistency and persevere with the right position sizing. That's really what profitable trading is all about. Absolutely. For those watching, take some notes. Um, we're going to put some links to Steve's website and some of his books uh, in the description. Uh, and thank you again, Steve, for being here. It's always a pleasure to have you on. I really appreciate you taking the time to, to share your knowledge. Oh, great to chat with you, Dan. All righty, let's look at the broad markets after an absolutely crazy week, starting with SPY. Um, first thing on the daily side of things, we had just, I mean, one of the strongest moves up I've seen in a couple, in an hour and a half, maybe, what was it, um, in a long time. So the one thing that I want to point out about that is notice on the raindrop chart here on the daily for Friday, you don't see a ton of volume at the top of the range here, which is something that's definitely worth noting. It, it doesn't take away from the fact of how big of a move everything um, was on Friday, not just SPY, but kind of everything into the close. But you know, with this type of move, you really want to see volume supporting price up at the top of this range for Friday's um, candle. And we just don't see that as much as you'd like. So something worth noting into um, next week, as well as the fact that we didn't have any substantial volume for Friday. Now on the weekly side of things, you'll see here that we did have this really strong volume shelf that the price has been trading at now for the last few weeks. Um, anchoring the volume by price from these September lows, pretty much the capitulation before the next leg up in the trend. You can see here, this was our low. We had higher lows ever since. And so this acted as a launch pad for price into the uh, end of the week. And if we really break this 397, 398 area, you know, 400 is the psychological barrier to keep in mind. Now, on top of that, definitely want to pull out seasonality um, for this particular episode because we're getting close to the end of the month for March. So if we look back since 2016, um, you know, January, February, March, since 2016, and why am I using 2016? Well, it's about, it's five years of data. So just looking back five years, but also the 2016 was a pretty important low for the market. The beginning of 2016 is really right after all that oil craziness was over, the market bottomed and we really continued higher. So that's an important area on the chart as well as just, you know, five years uh, looking back. Now, what's really interesting is April has a 100% win rate since 2016. So that is definitely something to keep in mind. We have this really strong candle here on the weekly side of things, and we have a very strong historically seasonally uh, or seasonal um, trend going into April. 100% of the time, April has closed green. So that is definitely worth noting. Going into the queues, uh, you know, the queues definitely did not move like SPY. We're kind of stuck in this symmetrical triangle here. Um, using TrendSpider, you simply just create alerts on both of these lines. And then you let the price action do the rest and let the alert system uh, send you a text or an email when either one of these lines have broken out. So remember, you just right click, create an alert. If you want to be alerted when the price actually breaks through this line, you're not going to need sensitivity. Maybe you want to um, sell at resistance and you want to know whenever the price is around this purple area, that's when you use the touch. So remember the alert system is really nice on TrendSpider to um, capture these types of moves. Now, same thing on the queues, not a lot of volume at the top of the range for Friday. That's slightly concerning. Um, you know, not, not something that's destroyed the chart into next week, but 
you know, for that type of move, I would have really expected some volume really aggregating at the top of the range, which we just didn't see. Now, on the weekly side of things, pretty similar setup as we had on SPY, where we have this volume shell forming from the September lows, uh, price is holding on to it for now. And then looking at the seasonality since 2016, April and May are historically very strong months for uh, the queue. So seasonality and possibly this volume shelf launch pad is looking interesting into the weeks and month ahead. IWM, uh, still trying to figure out what's going on on this chart. Uh, it's been it's been one that really got hit from the yields um, increasing pretty quickly uh, over the last couple of weeks. You can see here that we're pretty much stuck in the middle of this broadening formation. Um, and you can see here on the weekly side of things, uh, if we anchor the volume by price from the September lows, we're kind of stuck at this uh, the shelf around 225. And then we have another shelf here around 213, which acted as a nice area for supply to dry up. And the price was able to bounce pretty hard off that. Uh, this week. Now, same thing since 2016, IWM going into April, April has a 100% win rate. That is some very strong um, season, seasonality uh, looking back historically. That doesn't mean that we have a 100% chance of going up in April, closing green versus March. It means that over the last five years, since the beginning of 2016, April has closed 100% of the time. So even though it's showing that we do have really strong seasonality into April, that's not guaranteeing that we close very strong and green for April. Uh, DIA is the next one that we'll look at here. Um, DIA is one that's really looking strong, starting to break through this resistance that we've been watching for the last couple of weeks now. Same thing though, um, I'll mention a couple of things on DIA, which is just the Dow Jones ETF. If we turn on the gap snake, the automated gap detection here, you will see that the gap did fill on Friday, but you'll also see the lack of volume. This is becoming a recurring theme across all these charts. The lack of volume at the top of the range is definitely worth noting going into next week. Um, seasonality, 100% into April since 2016. So as you guys can see, April is a very, very strong month historically since we bottomed in early 2016. I think the, the true bottom was uh, February of 2016, but we're just going to go from the actual beginning of 2016, 16, as I mentioned, five years um, looking back. Now, Bitcoin's another one that we will look at here, uh, BTC USD on the Coinbase side of things. A couple things, we've been talking about this 5.618 extension, which is also the $60,000 psychological area that um, is clearly having a tough time breaking. You can see here that we've once again really just uh, held our ground right at this level on the weekly side of things. Now on the daily side of things, we've been anchoring the volume by price from this area, uh, the swing low here that we have in uh, mid-January. So if we do that once again, you'll see that the price is really kind of trading right around this middle shelf. We didn't get all the way down to this shelf around 48 uh, thousand. So we're kind of trading in the middle of it. We will see though, that we do have quite a bit of volume at the top of the range here. So that's something to keep in mind um, going into the week ahead. Um, and uh, clearly there's some conviction by buyers absorbing that supply up here. Uh, since 2016, Bitcoin has a hundred percent win rate for March. So if we look at March on the monthly side of things, um, we are seeing that we did close green once again. Uh, we now have six green monthly candles in a row, which uh, I did a back test. And uh, the last time that we had that was way back in, uh, this was in 2016. We had uh, six green candles in a row. And what you'll see here is the six green candle. Um, let's see. No, this may have been on the weekly. Oh, I think I think I did this on a different exchange. So either way, when I did the back test, I'm not sure it may have been on the Kraken exchange, but either way, um, this this six months in a row actually returned 540% within a year last time we had six green months in a row. So now obviously that doesn't have to happen again, but it's worth noting that just because we have six really strong green candles in a row does not mean that we're due for some massive correction. We could be um, at least somewhat of a pullback, maybe to you know this previous breakout zone um, on uh, on Bitcoin, but that would that would just that would 
probably not occur. I, I mean, that's literally 13 or 14,000 all time highs from 2017 are right around 20,000. I mean, could we break down all the way down to 20 K maybe, uh, but uh, we'll just have to see what the broad markets do. I mean, I generally look at Bitcoin as a measure of risk on risk off in the market. And anytime Bitcoin strong, generally the market is relatively strong. And so you can use, you know, Bitcoin as an air, as a gauge of, you know, the risk on risk off side of things, but you can also obviously use the VIX and the VIX, uh, even though the markets look scary over the last month or so, we keep hitting these lower highs. Um, even this week, when it looked like we were starting to accelerate to the downside, we keep hitting lower highs. I mean, we, we barely broke above 2350 on this last little dip on SPY. So um, definitely more the growth names um, that aren't necessarily correlated to VIX are the ones breaking down rather than SPY. Uh, and if we turn on the weekly chart here and turn on the gap snake, you'll see that we get closer and closer to finally filling this gap that we've only been talking about now for like the last eight months or year at this point, we've been talking about this gap pretty much ever since it, it happened. Um, now, if you look at VIX for April and May, this correlates pretty well with um, very strong conditions on SPY, QQQ, IWM, DIA, with uh, VIX only having a 20% win rate for April and May um, since 2016. So all in all, a lot of different things to touch on today. We, we There's a lot of gaps to keep in mind um, going into the month ahead. Seasonality is definitely something to keep in mind um, into the month ahead with a very strong historical seasonality um, reference to look at over the last five years. So all in all, hopefully this was helpful in uh, looking at the broad markets into the week ahead. And let's move on to the next segment. All righty, let's jump into the watch list segment. We have special guest Scott Redler, aka Red Dog, with T3 Live to go over some charts into what was quite a uh, crazy week and has been kind of a weird month in general. So, Scott, thank you so much for being a guest. It's an honor. I've been following you for a long time, not only on the chart side of things, but just your journey in fitness. It really kind of motivated me to get on the health kick. So thank you for that. And i um, really excited to hear what you have to say today about the overall markets. Well, thanks for having me. And what I try and advocate is a process. Like you just said, it's not all about charts. It's not all about the markets, it's about you know, fitness. It's about your balance. It's about how to deal with um, weeks like we've had, right? The past month or so has been very, very choppy. I know in November and December, I think I was getting texts and I was getting calls. Can I leave my job? I'm making so much money trading. And, you know, should I trade full time? I've been doing it part time. I made three times more than I did in my normal job. I'm like, easy does it, guys. It's not always this easy. There's not always this much continuity. Stocks aren't always making higher highs. You're not getting paid this way when you're right in a choppier environment. So let's just take a step back. So, Jake, I, I think having a watch list segment is very important because when the market changes, your watch list changes. Your process stays the same, but how you go about your day and your morning and putting it together must be different. So I start my morning at 4.45. I look at the overseas market, see what they're doing, see if Europe's strong or Asia's strong, see if our futures are tracking it or not. I then think about the composure of the market. So I talk about two approaches, one being what I call like a portfolio approach. When I'm in a portfolio approach, typically I'm massaging maybe 20 to 30 positions if the S&P is above the 821 day moving average. So a lot of people say, Red Dog, how many you know, indicators do you use? I do use a lot, but I basically use the 8 and 21 day moving average because that measures the short term active trend of the market to me. So when we're in the short-term active trend, I tend to have a lot more names on the watch list. There's probably a lot of names ready to make all-time highs where I could buy some when it's getting ready and add a tier, when it's ready to resolve to the upside, stay in for a measured move, sell some, stay with some. And that's a very healthy environment. We had that for you know a lot of the, the, the I would say the last four, since the March lows, even since the November lows, which I'll get into right here. If you look up the chart at the S&P Cash, you know, if you remember, you know, remember this low that we hit back in September made a higher low. So that was kind of like your double bottom. So the double bottom in the S&P kind of got me thinking more bullish to add more names to my watch list. Then we reclaimed 
the 8 and 21 day moving average right there, which then put that back into like it kind of confirmed it. And then if you look here at the, the trend, all right, this has been the trend pretty much since November, okay, on an upward slope. I like to, to also draw the accelerated trend. If you look here, this was your accelerated trend, okay, in this accelerated trend, which we were in for the most of, you know, the, you know, November all the way through December, it made it very easy to sit in a portfolio approach, take stocks into the watch list, off the watch list. At that point, tech was kind of acting okay, but we were playing, remember, you know, the value names were working out, the banks were working out, they were all above the 21 day. Then you had this one little move here. If you look here below the, the bigger channel, okay, not even the accelerated channel, and then the bears lost the ball. But then if you look right here, um, we hit 39.81, uh, I think last week. And now for the first time in multiple sessions, we're below the 8 and 21 day. So this morning when I put together my watch list, I was thinking a little bit more bullish. I had more positions on. It felt like tech was getting a little bit more flows and maybe Fang was getting a little bit better. And then every single day it has to change. So the first name I had on my watch list, you know, which I've been playing, has been Facebook because Facebook has been the closest to all-time highs and broke above a descending trend line. It was above all the moving averages. So let's go to the chart of Facebook. All right, so on the top of my watch list was Facebook because it seemed as if that tech was acting better. So what I wanna look at, at the name that's shown the most relative strength, and usually that's the name that's closest to its all-time high because if a group is gonna get leadership again, you need leaders. So I started getting back involved in Facebook. If you take a look here, when it was very tight. Most times, no one's talking about a stock on TV when it's very tight and the trade is setting up. They get very excited once it's already went up 10, 15, 20%. And that usually means it's ready for a pause. So right here, it wasn't that exciting. But to me, it was exciting because look at all the moving averages getting very tight. That's when I said, I'm going to put on uh, two different call spreads. So sometimes like, what strikes do you go with Red Dog? I'm like, well, it breaks this descending trend line, which is right here, which is a great indicator from TrendSpider, um, and holds it, that could start a new move because this series of lower highs is done, and that's what triggers um, a potential upside action. So right here, I'm like, if it gets above 270, why can't it get to 285 or 297? So I bought the 265 and 275 calls, and this was two weeks ago that expired Friday. So I needed a new setup. So this morning on my watch list, I'm like, okay, Let's see if Facebook could digest well, because um, it just hit resistance here. Can it hold the past two pivots? So I like to use pivots you know, for my tier size because I want it to act special. If it doesn't act special, that means it probably broke below a prior day's low, which it did yesterday. Then if it breaks below two days lows, I'm like, all right, maybe this isn't acting as special. It might move down my watch list from being like an A setup to a B setup. So right now with today's candlestick that broke yesterday's low and broke uh, Monday's low. <laughs> now it's a little different, but if you look at it from where it came from to where it went to, it's still at the eight day. So it's still kind of a decent setup and stays at the top of the watch list, but um, I might have a little less equity. I might have a little less, uh, a smaller tier size because it doesn't, to me, look like it's ready to go. When something's ready to go and triggers, that's when I'm in a bigger size, when it's kind of has to prove itself. And right now to me, it looks like you know, this has to prove itself again. So if Facebook could go sideways a little bit above today's low, or maybe even, you know, holds this little spot here, then perhaps it could turn back up. And then at some point, if tech is falling and ever lead again, it seems like, you know, Facebook could be the, the name to go to. So that was one of the names. So I did have some shares on and I got stopped out of my shares just because I'm like, you know what, it broke a prior day's low. Let me revisit it. Maybe a lower prices, but keep some of my options on that I'm being a little bit more looser with. Makes complete sense. And it was funny uh, about what was that? About two weeks ago, I was looking at that low that you mentioned in the the 260s where it just kept going up and down. And I was like, this, I'm going to start calling this like a barcode setup. It literally <laughs> looks like a barcode, those uh, different candles. So um, that was that was beautiful to see that break out. And it was it was kind of shocking to see how much strength that did have um, you know, versus some of the other ones out there. Um, Facebook, definitely one that's been on your watch list. Any other ones that have kind of come on the watch list as the markets evolved over the last couple of days? Yeah, well, if tech was going to have some kind of strength, I figured Google, 
that has not broken that earnings gap, that still shows some power. So Google started to become a little bit more of a focus also. But again, it's been hard to buy strength and then sell strength higher. But in, if, if tech was going to break out or just act better, it also was in the camp to me that perhaps it should be, I should have some options on. And then if it finally triggers above a level, I could have more on. So if you look here at Google, technically one of the indicators I look at is if it stays above an earnings gap like it did for three months while most of tech was getting battered and bruised in so many other sectors, wow, it stayed above 1990. That means there is some commitment to this upper level. So to me, I was watching 2064, 2113, and 2145. So what I did is yesterday, <laughs> I bought some $2,100 calls just in case it doesn't trade well and it goes and I want to be involved. And then I said to myself, if it triggers intraday and shows relative strength and some all the things line up, maybe I'll be a buyer above this and then see if it could work its way towards 2113. And if it get above that, all of a sudden, that to me is telling me that tech is getting some leadership back and maybe it could act better, but what did it do? <laughs> it got rejected at 2064, so I didn't add my shares. I just stayed in my calls that go out till next Friday, which I'm being a little looser. So to me, Facebook and Google were kind of interesting because I'm like, if tech's gonna get better, we need some kind of leaders and nothing else is that close to its all-time highs, let alone holding an earnings gap from last quarter. Makes sense. And it looks like you have a lot of gaps highlighted. Are you, uh, are gaps uh, targets a lot of the time for you to the upside and the downside? Yeah, I think gaps tell you a lot, especially pro gaps. If you get a gap like this in Google and they can't fill it because a lot of people are, are, you know, no one could own it from 1949 to 2145. So there's a gap here. If they protect the gap, usually that means it's powerful and can go quicker than if all of a sudden the gap fills and becomes choppier, then all of a sudden it's not as special as it was if a pro gap holds. A lot of time after earnings, you have a gap up. Sometimes it needs to digest. If it holds that gap and goes sideways, it gets above the top of the trigger post gap. That's you know a clue to, to get bigger because there's nothing to the left. So I love using gaps. You know, on a daily basis, you know, sometimes I'll I'll fade an opening gap you know, to get filled just for cash flow. But a pro earnings gap, which happens post earnings, could sometimes give you a, a direction clue to get into a swing trade. And then if all of a sudden that gap fails and it doesn't hold it, then that trade is off and it gets choppier and you have to wait for an additional setup. Makes sense. Uh, yeah, one thing I'll uh, definitely have to show you, Scott's, Scott's a new user of TrendSpider and we're honored to have him using it. One thing I want to show you uh, one of these days is the gap snake. It will automatically detect any of those gaps for us. So you can actually just click on it and it will show all of those and highlight them for you. So um, that's so it'll, it'll sift through every, every gap up there. That's, that's good. So that's, that would help me find new stocks for my watch list because I like that setup. Yep, it will it will show you any gap there is either below or above just as an area of, you know, of interest. So, um, yeah, that's that's something that I like to use a lot because a lot of the time it's hard to see, you know, if you're just quickly glancing at a chart, you know, is that a gap? Is that not a gap? And the uh, the gap snake feature does help with that. Um, I think we have time for one more chart. Is there any other one that's really kind of I know the market is evolving every day, but any one that uh, one more that you have your eye on that you're that you're keeping an eye on as the market evolves? I'm gonna give you two more, but I'll be real fast. So All let me right, show you the right. cues, because the cues right now are very important also. Look what happened here in the cues today. Okay, the cues had what I call a red dog reversal a bunch of weeks ago when the 10 year made higher highs and you had to move up to 324. So I was kind of thinking, hey, maybe we could hold in here to then clear 323, 24. It didn't happen. So now the Q's just broke below yesterday's low, broke below 315, it's back below the moving averages. So that to me says technology is kind of vulnerable again. So you have kind of Facebook failing near the highs, you have Google, you know, still in the range. So another name that I was looking at thinking, hey, last year was my biggest PL winner for me in all of 2020, meaning I was long at probably the most out of everything that was on my go-to list for cash flow every day because it was above the 21 day for most of the year. This year it hasn't been, but it looked a little bit more constructive to me. Guess what that is? Hey, everyone's favorite, Tesla. Tesla. You know, Tesla last year was my number one winner. I actually came out with a tweet when everyone, when the Cybertruck came out and everyone was bashing it. And uh, right two days before it, I'm like, I think Tesla's gonna triple and then everyone freaking crushed me. And I'm like, guys, you know, when is Elon Musk ever <laughs> uh, original, not original? Or when is he ever, you know, 
just bland and blase. So either way, here is when you know Tesla had a big move gap up. Look at that pro gap right there above the 821. They took out the range here and gave you a fantastic move to 940. So if you want to use my methodology on portfolio or tactical, well, it became tactical again right here when it broke 838. It went below the 8 and the 21 day moving average. So that moved down my watch list to, hey, I'm not going to trade it as much as I did last year because it needs time to absorb what a big move it's had. But mm -hmm. I kind of think that here, this was the bottom. And then you had a little bit of an inverse head and shoulders pattern being built. So left shoulder, a head, right shoulder, neckline. And at this point, it's starting to look a little faulty. So, you know, I actually sold some puts thinking, hey, it's not going to break 620. I hope it doesn't because then I might be put to stock and, and it could be going lower. And um, I tried trading it a few times in here and it's just been weak. So right now I'm flat the stock and I'm watching it to see can, you know, this I, I, maybe it can, you know, hold this still and still be somewhat valid. But if all of a sudden this right shoulder breaks, Chances are tech's faltering. The other stocks on my watch list aren't viable. And you have to see what's happening in other sectors. And everyone's saying, oh, value has been great. You know what? <laughs> the financials just had four or five down days. The, yep. the small caps just broke the end of 21 day. Um, the, the, the airlines have been down for five days. So there's not a lot of whole, there's not a lot of great special stocks out there right now to be at the top of the watch list. To me, it's more like I'm being tactical. I'm going to pick and choose my spots a lot more carefully because it's been harder to make money. And I think cash is a better position on the watch list right now until we get some more clarity from the overall tape. It makes sense. One question. Um, we've been going over the chart. Do you use any social sentiment on Twitter? Let's say that you're on Twitter and you see everybody is seeing the same thing you're seeing. Does that does that ever make you nervous? Or you does sometimes sometimes you think, oh, that's a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's going to play out. Or, you know, because a lot of the, uh, almost everybody on Finchwood has been talking about these inverse head and shoulders, myself included. And, you know, anytime you see that type of sentiment, everybody agreeing, does that, does that throw any type of signal for you? Or do you just see how it plays out and go from there? I guess you can call it the bandwagon technique. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, 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 I'm in the morning at 4.45, five o'clock, I keep the TV off because I don't want to get their opinions in my head. But I do say whenever you hear something on TV 20 times an hour and it's on the positive side, chances are it's probably near top. Anytime you hear about how it's been crushed 20 times an hour, it's probably near bottom. So remember the octagon on CNBC when markets are in turmoil, chances yeah. are the oscillators minus 70 and we're ready for a bounce. So there's definitely ways to use sentiment versus, you know, versus the trade that you're thinking about. Sometimes, listen, there's a lot of smart people on FinTwit, so sometimes Five, six guys have the same pattern, but it works out because it's a real pattern. You know, does this like this inverse head and shoulders pattern is still intact, but the pattern is false and void if really this 600, 630 level doesn't doesn't hold. So a pattern is a pattern and a, and and it's not a strategy until price confirms it. So you you always have to watch how a pattern evolves. And then I, I will say you have to watch sediment because if everybody sees it, like Kathy Wood. That day she was with Tesla on Monday with her 3,000 price target for 2025, and everyone on TV said, oh, Tesla can't go down. Meanwhile, it dropped 30 points in the last 10 minutes on Monday. It was a pain in my you-know-what, and it hasn't been that great since. So you're right. Sometimes, you know, if there's too many people on one side on Finn Twitter or on TV, you better be careful. Day makes complete sense. Well, Scott, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your watch list. How you really come up with a lot watch list and how it evolves over time. Um, I, if you guys are not following Scott on, on Twitter, definitely give him a follow. Is it red, red dog three, or red dog T three and red dog, make sure red you dog? make sure you get the right one. There's a lot of impersonators out there. It's R yeah. R E D D O G T three. And um, yeah, that, that's the real me. So uh, if, there's right. like a, if there's like three D's and two O's, that's not the guy. <laughs> uh, they'll I try and tell you here. something. Well, you're verified on Twitter as well, right? So yes. you know, everyone everyone knows if you have the blue check mark, that's that's the official account. So um, uh, Scott Redler, aka Red Dog from T3 Live, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your thoughts with us. And let's move on to the next segment. Thanks for having me, and thanks for having such a great product that could be so useful for traders out there. All righty, let's look at the weekend chart request. We have quite. Uh, a few new names that we're going to touch on today. So Neo, starting with uh, this one on the daily side of things, you can see here that 
We do have some gaps below still. Uh, not necessarily the strongest week for NEO. The one thing that I will mention is not only do we have gaps below, but we also have them above. So, um, you know, this, this can really go either way. I'm, I'm not in the business of, um, you know, predicting the future. We have to keep in mind, what are the levels? We know that there's gaps above. We know that there's gaps below. We have to watch price action and see which one of those is likely going to fill first. Now on the daily side of things, you know, who knows, we could have more or less of this W bottom forming. That's something to consider going into um, the month ahead. Now also, what's also interesting to consider on NEO is even though this IPO'd in 2018, we don't have a lot of data on this, but March has never closed green. It has a 0% win rate. So that is definitely indicative of uh, what we've seen over the last uh, month, just absolute blood in the water. So uh, this, this price action is correlating nicely with uh, this month's seasonality for sure. Then we pop back up to a 50% win rate. Uh, and then July is really when things get interesting. July's had a hundred percent win rate um, since since the inception of Neo. Now on the weekly side of things, this big gap up here in July, the anchored VWAP from this gap up candle has really acted as a strong level of interest uh, for either supply drying up or a mix of supply drying up and buyers stepping in. Um, so all in all, we have held this area three times in a row now and we have closed above it every single time. So that's that's something on the bull case side of things to keep in mind going into the week ahead. Um, X US Steel is the next one to check out. We did have a nice breakout here on Friday. You'll see that we had a clean breakout. And if we do go continue to move up, this area above would be the area to keep in mind this pivot around uh, to, uh, 2440, which is on March 12th. Go in, right click, create an alert at this line, Anytime the price gets anywhere around this area and touches it and the 10 minute candle closes anywhere within this purple zone will be alerted above. So resistance above, let's have, this, let's have this expire in 10 days. Alerts created. Now we don't have to watch the chart. Let's say that we have a strong move up on Monday morning. You don't have to be in front of your screen glued to see if we get anywhere near this line. Whenever the price does that, you'll get an alert. Um, through your email or your phone, and you know it's time to jump back to uh, to the charts and maybe jump on your broker and make a trade. Now, on the weekly side of things, we do have this pretty strong ascending triangle here. Now, uh, since 2016, this has not been incredibly, um, you know, a strong month uh, being March. But then you'll see April, and May, not a not a big uptick in win rates here. So. As far as seasonality goes for United States Steel, not too much of an edge that we're seeing here. The technicals do look rather favorable. So we'll have to see how that materializes into April. Now, Boeing is one that has had quite a pullback over the last few days, um, actually week and a half or so. On the weekly side of things, we have this rather big uh, ascending wedge here. On the seasonality side since 2016, March historically has not been a very strong month. This has been a relatively strong March. And then April and May and June have a 60, 60, and then 80% win rate. So we are starting to move into a potentially pretty strong time of the year for Boeing. Now, one thing that I'll mention here, if I turn off the gap snake and turn on the volume by price, and I anchor this from this swing low here, you'll see we've been kind of trading in this volume gap, this void of just not a lot of liquidity here. And you can see how crazy the price has moved within the zone. Um, so the two levels I would be watching would be this 255 area above. If we continue down, let's say this 230 down to 225 area below. Um, so we'll have to see which way price goes. Uh, two, two pretty very red weeks in a row, actually. We, we topped out at 278. We bottomed out at 232. So quite a big move down over the last couple of weeks. Will we get some type of uh, bounce near this uh, longer term level of support? We'll have to see. It's not support until it proves itself as support. ARKK, everybody's favorite, ARK Innovation. Uh, another potential W bottom forming here. Um, you know, a relatively strong close considering what things look like um, in the middle of the day on Friday. So we do have the potential W here. And remember, if you want to create a W, you want to create a smooth, a smooth line. If I can say smooth, uh, <laughs> good enough. Um, just click on this polyline tool here. So I'm just going to delete this. And then I'm going to click this polyline tool. One, 
two, three, four, and then five. That's how you can create it. Notice that I keep having this thing just continuing as I, as I uh, drew this last line. Just click enter and it will go away and you're able to um, stop, stop that feature. Now, if you wanted to curve this, just double click, click on the smooth feature here, the smooth box, and it will smooth the line. So for those that are asking how you can draw the inverse head and shoulders or the head and shoulders with the smooth lines, this is how you can do that. On the weekly side of things, you can see here that we have this Anchor View app from the March 2020 lows, and this has acted as a level of interest, um, both for supply drying up, but also possibly some, some buyers stepping in. You can see here that we did close below this Anchor View app, which isn't something I would call textbook by any means for a bull case, but we do have a higher low than last week, and that's something to consider. On the weekly side of things, uh, excuse me, on the monthly side of things, looking at seasonality, you can see April, May, June, July, August, all have 80% win rates. So we are moving into a very strong seasonal part of the year here um, for the ARC ETF and definitely something to note. I mean, those are not numbers to ignore. 80% win rate for five months in a row definitely is telling me this thing may have a pretty strong next couple months. Last one is PIN, uh, PIN Gaming. This is another one that has really respected the Anchored View app from the October lows really nicely here. You can see that uh, we pretty much gapped down almost right to it on Thursday. And then on the weekly side of things, you can see here if we anchor a volume by price from the, um, from the March 2020 lows, see there's not a ton of volume supporting price up here. Something to consider. A majority of shares, you've got a bulk of shares holding in the 60s and 70s. You have another bulk of shares holding in the 30s. What does that mean? Why is it important? Well, it tells us there's a lot of people holding at a profit here. And the more people holding at a profit, the easier it is for them to sell. You have enough people starting to sell and taking profit. That's how you get your, your waterfall effect. So um, to counter that argument on the bear side of things, at least just looking at the lack of volume supporting price for now, this vol these volume nodes can easily grow as price action um, materializes and this, this volume area could grow into a shelf. Um, but on top of that, we do have an 80% win rate for April going back um, since 2016. And uh, that is something to note, especially considering March only has a 33% win rate. If we look at the monthly candle, it is a pretty red month here. So that is right in line with that March seasonality. Um, so we'll just have to see if April's 80% win rate and seasonality does hold true with a pretty ugly monthly candle close. I mean, obviously we still have a couple of days left in the week next week before the monthly candle actually closes, but this has some work to do to really, uh, to really get bearish or bullish here going into um, to April. So that is all for the chart requests. Thank you everybody for tuning in this season. This season is officially over season three. Um, all of you have made this possible this show in general, just uh, a huge success for TrendSpider. Uh, we should be back in the next five to six weeks for season four. We have a ton of new guests coming your way and uh, make sure to like and subscribe because I will be posting the weekend videos while we're on this break. So I like to post the weekend videos on a Friday. Um, so we won't just be abandoning weekend content. It will just be on our YouTube um, on a video that I upload. So make sure to like and subscribe for that, but also season four coming up. And as always, if you have any questions at all about the platform, just let us know. You can send us a, a DM on Twitter, or you can send us an inquiry, hello at trendspider.com. And we do have that seven day free trial to try out any of these features that we went over. And we have a ton more on the platform that we weren't able to touch on. There's just too many uh, features to touch on to get to all of them in, in one of these segments. So everybody have a great rest of the weekend. Have a great week ahead. And thanks for watching. And we'll see you next season.